Hey everyone, my name is Anthony Wright. This is my wife, Chandra, and we are the pastors of Just Christ Ministries. We are so excited you have decided to join us for this worship experience. We're a church designed with the community in mind, working on the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. Thank you again for joining us. Let's go into service. Stay right there, David. 
Over my circumstance, you're giving me another chance. You reign. Over my circumstance, you're giving me another chance. You reign. worship for a minute. Hallelujah. He deserves it. He deserves it. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Have your way, God, in worship this morning, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, 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 oh,
from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship him for what he has done for us on the cross. It is because of what he did for us on the cross that's given us a right to eternal life. 
that's given us right to the blessings and promises of God. So on this first day, we want to just commune and just begin to look to the cross. The Bible says we should do is in remembrance of him. Amen. Looking back, remembering, praising, being thankful for the price that he paid for us on the cross. The Bible said God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to die for our sins while we were yet sinners. The Bible said few might die for a righteous person. But while we were yet broken, while we were yet scarred and, and just unacceptable, Christ saw value in us. Hallelujah. That's, that's a message right there. Being able to see value in yourself when you're not yourself. So we want to just remember what Christ has done. Because if you're anything like me, sometimes you can't forget. Especially when you're going through. It's something about storms that give you spiritual amnesia. Where you forget about what God has done, where he's brought you from, who he is in your life. So we have to take time just to remember, to reflect, get in God's word. The Bible said that he will bring all things to our remembrance, his Holy Spirit. So right now we just stand in God's presence and worship as we prepare to commune. We ask you, God, first to forgive us of our sins. You said that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we will confess our sins, you're faithful and just not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So God, we confess and we receive your forgiveness right now. Come on, receive God's forgiveness right now. Come on, receive his love right now. The Bible says, therefore, no condemnation. Come on, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Let that sit in for a moment that there is nothing you could ever do that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It is an unconditional, everlasting love that he has for us. And God, just as you have loved us and forgiven us, help us, God, to forgive others. Those who have wronged us, who have mistreated us. God, we don't want to harbor any unforgiveness in our heart, but God, we can't do it without your help. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to go deep down in those places to help us to heal God so that we can forgive and walk in our forgiveness. We pray, God, you would change this from his carnal to his spiritual use that will represent your body and your blood. Let's commune together. Amen. Come on, give somebody a fist bump. Tell them good morning. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Thank you. I know it was the blood for me. Come on, give somebody a fist bump. Tell them good morning. Come on, move around. You feel comfortable? And I know it was the blood. For me, it was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood. It was my Savior's blood for me. One day, one day, when I was lost, come on, hug him, hug him. Give him those fist bumps. And I know it was the blood for me. Come on, one time he's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming for me. One day, one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? Amen. Amen.
Can we just give God a shout out to triumph? Hallelujah! Amen. We have the victory. We are triumphant. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I want to take this time to welcome all of you in the building. It is such a blessing to see your face in the place. I want to also welcome those who are joining online. Amen. I'm asking when you guys feel comfortable to please come back and join us in the sanctuary. There is nothing like an in-person worship experience. Amen. So when you feel comfortable, please come back. Amen. I'm asking you all who are watching to please like and share. And as always, it is my prayer that during our time together, that something will be said or done to encourage you in your faith walk. And if you don't know Jesus, it is my prayer that you will come to know him on today. We have a couple of announcements to make. Amen. But before I make the announcement, I want to thank and praise God for Dominique in the back. Give her a hand. Thank and praise God for Brother Trey back there. Amen. Even Tyree. And I'm thanking God because, you know, the next generation of young people are emerging as servants of the Lord. Amen. And we're not intimidated by them. We're not trying to repress them. We're asking them to come forward and let God use them in their gifts. We have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, I announced on last week on Saturday, May the 14th, we're going to be having what I will call our family leadership meeting. Amen. We are believing God to raise up young and adult leaders, people of influence. Amen. So Saturday, May the 14th, we're having this family leadership meeting. We have a dynamic speaker coming. Uh, she's from John Maxwell Leadership Team. So she's come to do two sessions. One session will be with just our children, and the next session will be with our young adults and our adults. So leaders, we're not meeting today, but I'm asking everyone to come on the 14th. Bring your entire family. Only 45-minute sessions. So in between sessions, we have refreshments. You know, we have somebody out with the kids while the adults are in there. This is an opportunity you guys do not want to miss. It starts at 1230, right? All right, the next session will start 45 minutes after. Anybody excited about that? Amen. Whenever God opens up doors of opportunity for us to better ourselves, we should take advantage of it and be thankful for that. Also, the race against violence is also coming up again. Amen. Last year, we were not able to participate because of COVID, but they are having the race again. It will be out in Grant Park. People are coming from all over the city of Chicago to run against the race, against violence. Uh, they're going to have a guest singer. Wu-Tang Clan is going to be there. It's all free. All right. We're hoping that uh, Lakaya Blissier may show up. Amen. So it's going to be a wonderful time. And it's all about raising money for organizations all over Chicago who are doing work against violence. So I'm going to be sending out a link on Facebook to your emails. And this is a link where you guys could please share and donate. Amen. Whatever you can, $5, $10, whatever you give, it's going to go towards the Ring of Hope um, Strategic Social Investment Plan. That's what we're calling it. The Ring of Hope Strategic Social Investment Plan. We told you all in October we're having this big banquet called Level Up, where we're getting people to give towards this plan. This plan includes youth programming. It includes mental health services. It includes food security and job training and job placement. Amen. We're not just a church confined to these four walls. Somebody say amen in here. I believe that God has equipped and empowered the church to go beyond these four walls and to make a difference. So we have the great commission to spread the gospel. We also have a strategic plan to once again to provide you programming to address food security, amen, mental health, and job training, job placement. So I'm asking you guys to give towards this endeavor, share with other people, and once again, all of the proceeds will go towards our long-term strategic plan. You know, I'm believing God that he would help us to build institutions. I mean, staples in our community that will outlive us, that will be there for generations to come to provide stability and sustainability to our communities. But guess what? We're the pioneers. It starts, somebody has to start it. Amen. We, we, we are the match that will ignite the flame that will continue to burn on years after we're going. So I thank and praise God for gracing us to be the pioneers, 
to do the hard work so that generations to come can benefit the, the labor that we have sent forth. Amen. So please look out for that text, the email, see it on social media. Once again, give, like, share, participate. With that said, it's time to give. We thank and praise God for the blessing of giving because you can only give because God is first giving to you. So I thank and praise God for all the cheerful givers that are in the house. If you are giving in the building, please raise your hand. The ushers will assist you with an envelope. Just raise your hand. If you are giving online, you can go to our cash app at dollar sign JCM Chicago. Once again, that is dollar sign JCM Chicago. You can also text to give at area code 773-455-0008. Text the word give. Once again, that's area code 773-455-0008. Text to her, give. I see people pulling their phones out. Amen. We thank and praise God for that. You can also give on tithely. I am asking, according to the word of God, that every member of this church become a faithful tithe giver. And if you are watching, you don't have a church, and this church is blessing you, please consider sowing your tithes and your gifts of love in this ministry. We are good ground. And I want to just thank you all once again for your past, present, and future support because we could not do what we do without you. And believe me, there are great things in store for Just Christ Ministries. Come forward, ushers, please. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. Come on, y'all. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. Give, and it will come back to you. When you give, Give to the Lord. Come on, give, give, and it will come back to you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over. Give. When you give, give to the Lord. When you give, when you give, give to the Lord. One more time. When you give, give to the Lord. Amen. Give God one more hand clap of praise for the blessing of giving. Amen. Amen. Once again, I'm so happy to be here in the place. Amen. I count it a privilege and an honor to stand before you again on another Sunday. Amen. The first of May. Amen. Time is zooming by. It seemed like just yesterday was the first Sunday we were starting a new series. Amen. But we understand that time waits for no one. So we have to be about our father's business and fulfilling our purpose. Amen. Because we're all on borrowed time and we don't know when our expiration date is coming. So you want to live life to your fullest. That's my new motto now to just live life to the fullest. Amen. Doing things that brings glory to God and also makes me happy. Amen. So I'm excited about life. Anybody excited about life? I'm not talking about stuff with just life, being alive. Come on, having your health, your strength, being in your right mind. Amen. So with it being the first Sunday, we're starting a new series entitled Audit. Amen. I want you all to bear with me on today. I'm going to really lean heavily on my notes because God kind of changed my message around first thing this morning. Amen. That's why I was running a little late for Sunday school, but God is good. Amen. I am the kind of person that only wants to say what God wants me to say. And when God stopped talking, I want to sit down. You know, sometimes when I'm preparing, God will say things like, don't say that. That's manipulative. Don't say that. <laughs> he said, don't say that. That's the subliminal message. Don't say that. So I'm very careful to only say what God wants me to say. So we're talking about auditing or audit. And during tax season, how many of y'all file your taxes? I just filed mine Wednesday. Amen. So, so during tax season or the end of tax season, the last word that we want to hear is audit. Amen. When you hear that word audit or you get that letter in the mail, I mean, you initially go into panic and fear. Now, an audit 
is an official inspection of an individual's or organization's account. Amen? When the Internal Revenue Services does an audit, they look at all your financial records. All those things that we don't want them to see. Because we know the more money we make, the more money they're going to want to take. So we're trying to hide everything we can from them so we can save as much money as we can. But they want to see it all. They want you to file that stimulus check you got too last year. When you have a good account, they're going to ask you, you get that stimulus check. You got to tell them yes, because if you don't file it, they're coming for you. They want to make sure that all those kids you claim really belong to you. They want to make sure you have receipts for all the stuff you wrote off. When the IRS does an audit, they want to look at everything. Now, as much as we are concerned about the IRS and them auditing us, the truth is only one out of 143 Americans are audited a year. So it's not, it's not really a big deal as much as we think it is being audited by the IRS. But there is a spiritual audit that we all need to be aware of because all of us have to participate in this particular audit. Look at Romans 14. Romans 14, 11 and 12. See, the Bible talks about how we fear man and what have you, but the person we should fear is God. And the Bible said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So in other words, if you don't fear God, you're a fool. But when you fear God, that is wisdom. And it's, a, it's not a fear of, ooh, you're going to get me. It's a reverential fear. It is the acknowledgement that you are God, you are sovereign, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. Look at Romans 14. It says, for it is written in scripture, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God or for God. Each of us one day, whether you're Buddhist, Muslim, atheist, Christian, the Bible said one day every knee is going to bow and confess Jesus as Lord, and then we have to give an account of our lives. Look at Hebrews 4 and 13. Hebrews 4 and 13. It says, And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed. God sees and knows everything. What we try to hide from people and are even in denial about ourselves, God sees everything. It says, and reveal to his eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. So God sees everything, and one day we have to give an account to God. Now, when we talk about this spiritual audit, as believers, we're not being audited as to whether or not we go to heaven or hell. Because once you accept Christ, your ticket's been stamped. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. You have been sealed to the day of redemption. And there is nothing you can do to lose your salvation. So we're being audited, though, and we're being, being held accountable as to living our lives according to God's standard. See, once you get saved, there is still a level of accountability that we must meet as it relates to living according to God's standard. Now, before an audit, I want you to pay attention. Before an audit, it is suggested that you do a self-audit. And that is you checking yourself before you get checked. It's an internal invest. Let me make sure I got all my ducks in order. I got all my receipts. Before you go for an audit, you want to make sure you do a self-audit. So during this series, all we're doing is just self-auditing. We're not judging anybody else. We're auditing ourselves, and we're looking at the things that we as believers will be held accountable for. Look at our theme text in 2 Corinthians 13. 2 Corinthians 13 to 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. You know, we, we live in a day now where we think that we can call on the name of the Lord and live any kind of way and do what we want to do, how we want to do, but that's not so. 
It is not, I don't care what the media says. I don't care what culture says. As believers, we are held to a higher standard of living. The Bible says that we are a peculiar people. We are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are in the world, but guess what? We are not of this world. And God wants us to do a self-audit to make sure that we have not become contaminated by the world. Amen. Look at our text, 2 Corinthians verse 13 to 5. You got to say amen. amen. It says, test and evaluate yourself to see whether you are in the faith and living your life as committed believers. Examine yourself, not me. Or do you not recognize this about yourself? By an ongoing experience that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth because there were some issues going on. Amen. Similar to some of the issues going on in the church today. And Paul is admonishing them to do a self-check, a self-evaluation, a self-audit before he has to check them. Look at 2 Corinthians. Go up to verse, chapter 13, verse 1. I'll give you guys some background. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 2. You got to say amen. Paul said, this is the third time that I am visiting you. Every fact shall be sustained and confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already warned those who have sinned in the past and all the rest as well. And I warn them now, even though I am absent from you, as I did when I was with you the second time, that if I come back, I would not spare anyone. Paul is giving them a fair warning to check themselves. Paul said, I visited more than one time. The first time he went, it was to establish the church. And the scriptures talks about how he stayed there a year and six months working with the people, discipling them, building the church. And then he left and went on mission. He had to come back a second time to deal with some difficult things going on in the church, and his visit was brief. And he says, now I'm preparing to come back a third time, and if I have to come back a third time, I'm not sparing nobody. I'm going to tell you the truth in your face and let you have it. We're going to see that we need people in our life that can tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us God. So, 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 so Paul said, don't make me have to come back there. What they were doing was they were testing Paul's gangster. Y'all better hear me on today. See, the church was questioning Paul because they didn't see him necessarily operating in the power of God the way they thought he should. They thought that he was too weak, that he was soft, and they wondered, is God really speaking through him? See, sometimes we associate the move of God with theatrics and lights and loudness and all that drama and stuff that goes to passion tree. But he said, look, we don't see that with you, Paul. Are you really from God? Look at verse 3 and 4. It says, Paul said this, he says, since you seek forensic proof that Christ is speaking in and through me, he is not weak or ineffective in dealing with you, but powerful within you. Verse four says, for even though he was crucified in weakness, yielding himself, yet he lives resurrected by the power of God, his father. We, for we too are weak in him as he was humanly weak. Yet we are alive and well in fellowship with him because of the power of God directed towards us. Amen. So when we talk about this spiritual audit, we oftentimes associate a move of God with boldness, independence, self-sufficiency. But Paul is saying and he is demonstrating that the power of God flows best through us when we are weak and when we are humble, when we are totally depending on him. The Bible says when we are weak, that's when we are really strong because we realize that we can't do it on our own, but we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Let's look back at our text. Verse five. Paul says, Test and evaluate yourself. Do a self-audit. 
Don't look at other people, look in the mirror, test and evaluate yourself. He says to see whether you are in the faith and living your life as committed believers. Paul is asking them, are you really a Christian? Not me, but Paul. Paul is saying, are you really a Christian? I know you went through the sinner's prayer. I know you joined the church. You're working in ministry. I mean, are you really a Christian or are you a Christian in name only? Because, see, as Christians, it's not just wearing the name of being Christians. It is a lifestyle that goes along with the name. He said, examine yourself, not me. We spend so much time trying to examine other people, who's holy, who's not, who's saved, who's not. That's not your job. You, you don't know who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. That is not your job. There is only one judge, one righteous judge, and he makes that final decision. The only destiny you control is your own. He says, so examine yourself, take your eyes off me and mind your own business. He says, or do you not recognize this about yourself? By an ongoing experience that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit. So he says that Jesus can be in us and we not really recognize it. Or he's not in us at all and we're counterfeits. Can we talk today? He said Jesus is either in you or he is not. Now, when I talk about Jesus being in us, I'm not just talking about conversion. I'm not just talking about you believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. What that does is that invites Jesus to come into our life. And I tell you this, sometimes based on our behavior, people even doubt. Are they really saved? Based on how they're acting? Based on how they're cursing? And I'll go a step further. Sometimes because of our behavior, we doubt if we really say. Come on, talk to me on today. We, we, we ask the question, when I accepted Christ, was I too young? Was I, was I young? I need to get rebaptized. Come on now. We, we question, you know what? When I accepted Christ, was I in a bad place and just looking for an escape? I don't know about you all. When I gave my life to Christ, I was messed up. I want an Indian everything. Help me, Lord. Save me, Jesus. Did we accept Christ because of our situation? Or was there something going on in our heart? Or, or was it the sermon? Was it the choir or the people? Was, was it something outside of God that made us accept him as our Lord and Savior? See, all these things can be doubted as it relates to God being in us. But what cannot be doubted is when he is alive in us, his power flows through us. Come on, you can doubt all you want, but when Christ is in you and he is alive, there is power flowing through you. I'm talking about delivering power. I'm talking about keeping power. I'm talking about power to keep your mouth shut when you want to curse him out. Power to keep your hands off of people. There is a power that's in us when Christ is alive in us. See, you can believe all you want because you paid your light bill that the lights are on. It's not until it gets dark and you hit that switch and the power comes on that you know you have paid your bill. So it's not just about us saying that we have accepted him as Lord and Savior. It is a lifestyle. It's, it's Christ alive in you. It's his power through, flowing through you. So what are we looking for as we examine ourselves? Paul said we're looking to see if Christ is in us. All right. So we're not trying to evaluate how sinful we are, how much we mess up, because if Christ is in us and he's alive, you ain't got to worry about sin. Y'all better hear me on today. When, when, when Christ comes alive in you, you don't have to worry about sin. Look at 1 John 3. I say I don't want to get too excited today, but this word is good to me. 1 John 3 and 9. 1 John 3 and 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys say amen. amen. It says, no one who is born of God deliberately, knowingly, 
and habitually practice sin because God sees his principle of life, the essence of his righteous character remains permanently in him, who is born again, who is reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose. It says, and he who is born again cannot habitually live a life characterized by sin because he is born of God and longs to please him. See, when Christ is in us, that don't mean that we can't or won't sin. Let me say it again. You can have Christ in you, and you can, and you will sin. But the Bible says where Christ is alive in us, we cannot remain permanently in the same sin. Y'all better say man in here. The conviction of the Holy Ghost is real. You, when, when Christ comes into your life, the Bible says all things are passing away and behold, all things are as new. That don't mean you don't sin, but you don't stay in the same sin. Come on now. There's some of us right now fighting the same sin over and over again because we won't let Christ arise and become alive inside of us. When Christ is in us, he enables us to overcome sin. Is there anybody here besides me? Who's been battling with a sin that you knew you couldn't overcome, you couldn't stop doing, you wanted to do it, you liked doing it. But when Christ came alive in you, he delivered you. Come on now, broke some strongholds in your life, some generational curses. Why? Because Christ came alive in you. I mean, you accepted Christ, but he wasn't alive in you. We're going to see that Christ can only become alive in us when we begin to yield to him. When we begin to give him permission to have free reign in our lives. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8 verses 9 through 10. Romans 8, 9 through 10. You got to say amen. It says, however, you are not living in the flesh, controlled by your sinful nature, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God lives in you. When God lives on the inside of us, we are no longer controlled by our sinful nature because his spirit lives in us. That don't mean we don't fall and we don't make mistakes. But once again, it's not so we practice. It says directing and guiding you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. You are a counterfeit. You are a counterfeit. The Bible talks about wolf in sheep clothing. Everybody that, 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 that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to be saved. But once again, we're not examining them. We're examining ourselves. Verse 10 says, if Christ lives in you through your natural body, dead, I'm sorry, through your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which he provides. So our, 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 our sinful nature now is dead and we become alive in Christ. Amen. In his righteousness, because the Bible said the wages of sin is death. But through his righteousness, now we become alive. Now, as we examine ourselves we, and do a spiritual audit, let's look at three ways for us to know that Jesus is alive in us and his power is flowing through us. Can we do that? One of the ways that we know that Jesus is in us is when he is Lord in our life. Come on, he is Lord in our life. Now, I'm not talking about him being the Savior who has forgiven you of your sins. I'm talking about Jesus being Lord and him reigning in your life. Now, once again, that don't mean we don't step out of line, but when he checks us, we respond to it because he's Lord. Come on now, anybody got kids that sometimes get out of their body and they want to talk back and do stuff, but when you check them, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Same way with us. When, you, when, when Christ is alive in us and he checks us, guess what? We respond. Yes, sir. Yes, daddy. Why? Because we recognize his authority in our life. Has anybody been checked by God before? When you thought you were doing what you were, God said, now sit yourself down. Shut your mouth. Walk away. And because he is Lord, guess what? We surrender. We submit. Look at Galatians 2 and 20. Galatians 2 and 20. We know that Christ is alive in us when he is Lord. 
when we give some free reign to control our life. I told you all last week, I am making all my decisions now based on my consultation with God. Let, let me tell you, listen, I'm not making no decisions about what to buy, where to go, who to befriend. God, you tell me what to do. And I say this, if it ain't your will, I don't want it. I got, if I'm too dumb to see it's not you, block it, stop it, prevent it. Why? Because if it's not of God, I don't want it. Because the enemy will bless you to bind you. Y'all ain't hear what I said. See, everything that looks good is not God. And so he is the father of lies. He is a trickster. He's a manipulator. And he could give you what you want and make you think it's God. I don't want it if it's not God. Look at Galatians 2 and 20. I'm learning now when God gives you something, he sustains it. He gives you a grace for it. He takes care of it. Come on now. Whether it be a marriage, a job, or a car, when it's from God, he takes care of it. Galatians 2 and 20. I'm almost done. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. You have to die for Christ to come alive in you. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't ready on today. It says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ, once again, cannot live in us until we decide to die because you can't have two lords in your life. As long as you're your own Lord, you're doing your own thing. Christ cannot be Lord in your life. He's there because you're saved, but he can't come alive. He can't do what he want to do in your life until we surrender to him. So we know he's alive in us when we learn how to recognize his lordship. Come on now. When we say, God, you know what? My life literally belongs to you. When you die, I die with you. And I am buried in Christ. I am a new creature. You are a new creature. That is how we know that Christ is alive in us. The second way that we know that Christ is alive in us is our ability to love. Come on now, the fact that we're able to love people and forgive people who have done us wrong, who have mistreated us, that's God in you. <laughs> that, 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 ain't, that ain't our nature. It is God in us. Look at 1 John 4, verses 7 to 8. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. We need to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith, if we are doing the things that God wants us to do. We're going beyond a Sunday morning service. We're going beyond a praise, a dance, and a shout, and we're entering into a lifestyle. We're going into, somebody say, holiness. holiness. Now, that may sound like a scary word, but it only means that you're set aside for a purpose. That means that God has a purpose for your life, and because of that, certain things you can't do. Certain places you can't go. Some people can't be your friend, not because you're better than them, but because you're holy. You have been set aside for a purpose. Anybody know you got a purpose in here? Then you're holy. You have to sanctify yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have to sanctify yourself from people, places, and things so you can live the holy, righteous life that God's called us to. And so we have to audit ourselves again. Have I been doing that? Have I been compromising? Have I, have, have I been in my word? Have I been praying? You know, I need to now examine myself because one day I'm going to be examined. Look at 1 John 4. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 8. It says, Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. For love is from who? God. And anyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. Come on now. You've been spending time with God. You've been talking to God. And we have been born to God. And God is teaching us how to love. You know how he's teaching us how to love other people? By how he loves us. He, he, he's teaching us how to love others based on how we love them. Every time I want to go off, God said, what about you? I said, God, babe, I said, but... I apologize. They apologize too. God, do I treat you like that? 
So he is teaching me how to love others, teaching us how to love others based on his love for us through our personal experience. Verse 8 says, the one who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him. For God is what? Love. He is the originator of love, and it is his enduring attribute of his nature. So when people are running around saying they're Christians. Hey, everyone. My name is Anthony Wright. I don't know. It's not my place to judge. But when we're talking about what it looks like to have Christ alive in us, then we're going to be loving. I've seen God include myself. When he becomes alive in you, he can change the stoniest heart, the meanest person. Anybody know anybody like that? I mean, when their whole life just turned around because Christ became alive in them. It is Jesus that helps us to love and forgive when he becomes alive in us. The Bible says that they will know that we are his disciples by our love, by our love. Now, last but not least, we want to look at another way that we know that God's alive in us. And that is when we are able to continually submit to authority when we are teachable, when we allow other people to check us, that's a sign that God's alive in us. Because in ourselves, you can't tell me nothing. I'm grown. You, you, you better not try to check me. You're going to get checked. But when Christ is in us and the old man has died, now we are accountable. We, we submit to authority. And guess what? We are teachable. Last scripture, Galatians 4, verses 19 to 20. Are y'all with me so far? Because see, we're, we're taking all the guesswork out of this. After this series, you don't have to wonder if you're saved, if you're in Christ. You're going to know according to the scriptures. Somebody said amen. <laughs> How many of y'all want to know? For real, for real. To be sure of your salvation. To make sure you're doing the things that God requires of us. Because I'll tell you all something. It could get lost in translation. Listen, they call this the information age, the information world. There is so much information out there. I mean, we're being exposed to all type of stuff. And what happens is when you have all these different options, Christ no longer becomes your only option. See, we have to get to the point where we can take in information, but we filter it through Christ. We filter it through the, the word of God. And unfortunately, our kids are able to do that. They're just, they're just open. There are no filter. Everything just coming in. Sex and drugs, all type of stuff, and there is no filter. So we have to have the word of God in our heart so that we don't sin against God. I tell people all the time, there is an attack against our young people because the devil's after the future. He's at, listen, he knows in the end he's going to lose. He knows he's defeated, but he's taking everybody he can with us. So he said, if I can't get you, I'm going to get your kids. I'm going to get your kids. Look at Galatians 4. Here's a liar. Here's a liar. How do we make him a liar by doing the right thing? See, it's not just enough to say he's a liar. We have to now say proof our family. Come on now, with the word of God. Come on, binding, praying, loosing the truth of God's word. See, that's how the devil get up off you. It's not just saying it. We have to put those safeguards in place. Galatians 4. Galatians 4 and 19. Enemies playing for keeps. <laughs> listen, listen, he don't have nothing to lose. Yeah, can you imagine being the person knowing your fate? And you're mad and angry. And he's really jealous of us. He's jealous of us. The fact that God loves us so much that he will make us the apple of his eye. He hates us for that. And he wants to take all of us down with him if he can. But like you said, he is a liar. Look at Galatians 4. And Joshua asked for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Any and everything can go on in my house. Listen, I want to be as liberal and loving as I can. But if it is demonic, if it is not of God, you cannot let that stuff. And it's innocent. I may put a nice beat to it, nice music. And if you listen to the words, oh, man. The beat is nice. It's catchy. It's nice. But you listen to the words of what's being said. And our kids have these headphones on listening. You know, you have to guard your ear gate, your eye gate, because the enemy's trying to come in. 
I'm telling you all. I'm telling you. I know I'm going this way. We have to safeguard our families. We have to because, let me move on. Galatians 4. Galatians 4 19. How many of y'all love your family? See, we're going to make sure our family has food, shelter, a place to stay, go to school, go to the doctor. What about spirituality? I mean, listen, there are some things that you can't be vaccinated against in the spirit. You can eat all the good food you want, but it does nothing for you in the spirit. You can get a master's degree, doctor's degree, but it does nothing for you in the spirit. But when you do, when the spirit, soul, and body, when the whole person is strong, now you're ready. But we have neglected the spiritual side of us. Even when our kids, we give them an option now. Do you want to serve God? In a, listen, in my house, you don't have an option. You see Josh back in the back? He came in this morning. Look, you going to church? Yeah. Only we gym, honey, because of COVID. But he got, because you grown with you in my house. Can y'all talk to me on today? Don't get mad, but just, let's just tell the truth. Because I, I know that we have an adversary who's going to and fro as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I don't care how much money I leave my kids. How much property. If I don't leave them a solid spiritual foundation, I ain't did nothing. Because they'll lose it. Well, I got to make money for my kids. But if you don't give them a spiritual foundation, the enemy's coming for it. Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Galatians 4, 19 and 20. I'm passionate because I'm concerned about our future. I don't want what we're doing to die with us. I want to see young people strive and do better than us. But, they, but we have to give them that foundation. And guess what? God has already shown me the next person takes over this church, it takes a whole other level. I'm a pioneer. These builders and stuff, that's, that's my assignment. Can we talk on today? These buildings, these programs, that is my assignment. He's called me a pioneer. People say, well, Pastor, you know, it's like, no, no, I'm anti-social. My mind is fixed. My, I'm in 30 different places. I have an assignment to do, and I, I'm looking forward to the day when my assignment is done. Then we could talk. We could, I mean, I'm, I'm all there, but I know my assignment. But the next person that comes is going to a whole nother level. I mean, a whole, because guess what? The foundation is laid. We're talking about debt free, multiple properties. Programs, non for profit, all this stuff. Guess what? We're building this. This is what we're building. The next person step in, they go to keys to this building, keys to that building, keys to that building. This is your program, program there to take it to a whole nother level. Why? Because, because the enemy stepped his game up. See, once again, he's now dealing with technology, all type of other stuff, and now we have to turn our game up to meet the need of our young people in this generation. Galatians 4, Galatians 4, 19 and 20. It says, my little children, of whom I am again in the pain of labor until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. Paul said, I am in labor pain because I have to do this until Christ is completely and permanently formed in you. It says, how I wish that I were with you now and could change my tone because I am perplexed in regards to you. So we know that Christ is in us when somebody's able to teach us, when we're able to submit to authority, and guess what? We don't mind that happening. Paul says, I consider myself a spiritual father to the Galatians. He gives a metaphor of a woman giving birth and the birthing pains that a person goes through as you birth somebody into Christ. Now, something happened that the Galatians start to drift away. And he talked about having to birth them again and go through the same pain again of getting them to Christ. So we need to understand that we can be in Christ, but sometimes about the Galatians, we can drift away. And we need people in our life that can hold us accountable. The Bible talks about how we have to submit one to another. See, we need to understand that God, when he's in you, he will assign you spiritual midwives. Some of y'all got that. When Christ is in you, 
He will assign spiritual midwives so that when we drift away, as we do, there are people who can birth us back into Christ. There are people who can hold us accountable to the things of God. So, so who is your midwife? Is it your pastor? Is it your parent? Is it your spouse, your friend, etc.? And who are you helping birth what God's put in them? Because just like God has people helping us, there are people that we need to be helping as well. Paul said in verse 20, he said, I wish that I were with you now and could change my tone because I am perplexed in regards to you. Now, if you say something to people like that today, they leave in the church. Y'all ain't gonna say man in here. They filing for divorce. They blocking you on social media. And your kids even call DCFS on you. Because we live in this soft age where you can't say anything that's going to hurt anybody's feelings. If what you say offends somebody, shame on you. And we have become, I think David Perry said, we've become brittle. Every little thing breaks us. Paul said, look here, if I was in front of you, my tone would be different. He said, I am very dissatisfied in you because I know Christ is in you. And because he's in you, I expect more from you. You need people in your life that will call you to the carpet regarding who they know you are in the spirit. Not people that enable your behavior. Girl, I understand. No, 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 no. If I was in front of you, I would tell you a thing or two. Because I love you. When people love you, they will tell you what is best for you. And when Christ is in us, guess what? We submit to that. Because it's not us. Because once again, I'm grown. I pay my own bills. Who do you think you are? But when Christ is alive in us, and because what they're saying is true, we recognize it and we submit to it. I'm closing by saying this. If you have accepted Christ and he is not alive in you, because there's a difference. You can have Christ and he not be alive in you. Either he is in you and you don't recognize him because you have not fully surrendered to him. The more you surrender to God, the more his power becomes alive in you. Because see, what happens is we limit his access. God, you can be Lord of my life on Sundays. And on Sunday, boy, you feel the power of God and you dancing. But after church, God deuces. He's now dormant in your life. Because you have not given him permission to be your Lord and you follow him. Or you have not accepted Christ at all. And you're a counterfeit. You have to examine yourself. Either way, we have hope. See, we can fully surrender to the power of God so he can come alive in our lives. Or we can sincerely, with a whole heart, welcome Jesus into our life. Did y'all get that? If you have Christ, as you surrender, he becomes alive. If you have not accepted him fully, you can do that. You can do that. But we have to examine ourselves and not other people because one day each of us have to give an account to God. Come on, stand on your feet. 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 I can't wait to get deeper into this series so that we can once again know without a shadow of a doubt what God's requiring of us. Maybe there's someone here right now who don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want to sincerely give your life to him he will accept you just as you are just as you are you don't want to leave here today and not be saved because tomorrow is not promised we're talking about life and death we're talking about eternity every head bob your eye closed if you're here right now and you don't know Christ your Lord and Savior I want to pray for you Put your hand up, put it down. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't see any hands in the building. Maybe you're online and you want to know Christ your Lord and Savior. If so, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe you sent your son to die for my sins. Come into my life. Save me. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, your sins have been forgiven. You are now a son and daughter of the Most High God. God's spirit lives inside of you. Amen.
And the more you yield yourself to God, the more you will see that transformation taking place. You will begin to see that sanctification process begin. But when you accept Christ, you need to be a part of a church. And not just any church, but the church that God has called you to. Now, if you're in the building or online, God's called you to this church, we will accept you now. If there's one in the building now. If you're online, you can join by dialing the number 773, text the number 773-455-0008, text the word JOIN. That's 773-455-0008, text the word JOIN. If you just want prayer, you can also text that same number. Is there one in the building? Amen. Give God one more hand, a couple of praise. As we close out, I want to just say this. I want my salvation to be assured. I want to know I'm in right standards with God, doing what God wants me to do. And in order for that to happen, I got to look in the mirror. I have to examine myself according to the word of God. Anybody up for the task this series? Come on, anybody up for the task to really do a self-examination? Amen. Father God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. As we leave this place, God, we will not leave your presence. Go with us, stand by us. Keep us covered with your blood. Until we meet again, all God through. Amen. Amen. Get somebody a fist bump. Tell you love me. Jesus loved them too.